I'm Margaret Frondorf, Director of SICE Alumni Relations, and I'm here with Ambassador George uh, Lumbracus, and today is uh, March 31st, 2011. And George, I'm going to ask you just a few questions about your days at SICE, and uh, feel free to um, um, say whatever it is that, that you would like. So I want to start off by asking you, what brought you to SICE? What were the circumstances that led you uh, to, to our school? That's a good question. Um, I was an English major at Princeton, and uh, when I came close to graduation, I realized I didn't want to teach, I wanted to do something. And as an English major, it's very difficult to do something. Uh, because I was also interested in politics and had done a fair amount of that on the side, I thought, well, let's get a master's in politics. Uh, the Fletcher School was the first place that came to mind, and I applied there, and they accepted me. But then I heard about SICE, which was an offshoot of Fletcher, uh, was actually set up after, with sort of inspired by Fletcher. And because it's in Washington, I thought, hey, that's a better place to move on to the government. I wanted to work for the government. This was the 1950s. I graduated in 52 from Princeton. And uh, in those days, you know, we weren't talking about working for banks or so on. Uh, the closest I came at the end of my master's at, at, uh, at SICE was uh, Aramco or J. Walter Thompson uh, advertising, but there were very few people doing anything besides government at that time. So I went there, and actually I was, uh, uh, I was allowed to come on probation in the summer because I didn't have that major. Uh, then they kept me on, um, and uh, I stayed for a year. I was in the last group that got through in one year. They made it a two-year uh, degree after 53 and one or two of my classmates stayed on for a second year. Um, but Bologna was opened right after that, and Seagrove Haynes, who was the top sort of Europeanist and was my uh, main professor because that's what I was majoring in, that and Eastern Europe, Soviet affairs. Um, and I learned Soviet, I learned Russian. They, I knew Greek and I knew French, so I had to learn a new language. And, it was Russian. Um, and uh, basically, I stayed on there and eventually graduated after one year. So, so tell me a little bit about uh, vivid memories that come to mind, both in Washington, D.C., and then, and then uh, to, at Bologna as well. Well, I didn't Sorry. go to Bologna. I, I, uh, it was opened after I left SAIS. Um, I stayed on at SAIS after I graduated. Uh, passing the oral exam <laughs> with distinction. Uh, and they gave me a small scholarship for the summer, so I stayed on for the summer. Uh, the State Department at that point was not hiring and uh, because uh, Eisenhower had cut the budget completely. Um, so I had to sort of survive, and I did things like door-to-door -door selling encyclopedias, uh, teaching Greek, then I got a job teaching business leadership by correspondence to people from various businesses. But the outstanding memories, uh, if we can try to think of them, um, first of all, we were in one building. Most of us slept in it as well as taking our classes and well, as well as having all the administration in that one house. Florida Avenue. Uh, I. Mm -hmm. Doubt we had as many as 20 graduating in my class. I understand it's up to the 500 or so now. Um, it was Florida Avenue. Uh, we were quite intimate with the professors, so we could get away with running a Christmas uh, play which, in which we made fun of them and the administration. Uh, we kind of uh, imagined some uh, uh, erotic interest between some of them, which, uh, and so they were, they were the audience, really, uh, because most of the students were in the play, they were not the audience. Uh, I directed that, and as I told you, uh, Sam Lewis was the producer. Uh, Sam was probably the, the brightest guy in our class and had a very successful career.
career in the Foreign Service afterwards. There were some other uh, stars in the class who did well, very well in government afterwards. We had also, uh, for example, uh, Ted Sorensen's sister, Ted Sorensen being the Kennedy right-hand man, uh, she was there getting her master's with us. Um, a girl named Jody Lewinson, who did very well with USIA afterwards, and a number of others. Um, we also had the Le Days, Le Day, he, him and her, and um, I guess he was the closest thing to uh, uh, a playboy that we had there. He played the piano beautifully, he was very handsome, he was social, and he was the guy who actually played for the background for our musical, which was based on HMS Pinafore. And we made up the characters, basing him on the various professors and administrators. Um, when it came time to look for a job, I was having trouble, but they knew what I was looking for. And the way I got my first break was walking up the stairs when Paul Nitze was walking down the stairs. And he said to me, George, they have just started to hire at USIA. You better get over there if you want, which I did. And I was in the first entrance group of the US Information Agency of junior officer trainees. We were called public affairs trainees. I think I have a picture of our swearing in. I think there were six of us, of whom two or three were from SAIS. Um, they, I'd already passed the written uh, foreign service exam, but that, and they knew that. So all we did was an oral exam. And as I was uh, finishing up, they said, we're very interested in your French. And I thought, ah, Paris, here it come. I'd been to Paris, you know, as a sophomore in school. And they said, we would like to send you to Saigon. And I said, Saigon, where is that? I'd never heard of it. Um, so I had to look it up on the map, and uh, that was my first assignment. I did a year in Saigon with the USIA as a trainee, and then they sent me to open up a post in, in southern Laos. We had opened up Laos for the first time in the capital, and they wanted to have me as a branch PAO, one-man posting, and actually I had two posts because I opened it up in a different place from the one where they, we originally were thinking. So we had two posts. Uh, I was the king of southern Laos for a little while. But uh, the other things, I can't think of too many other things. I'm trying to think of uh, things. Maybe you can uh, ask me some more questions. So you started to talk about your career, and, um, and you've had many accomplishments in your several decades uh, 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 with the uh, US State Department and beyond. And so the, what would be the one thing that stands out in your mind as being your most significant accomplishment? Um, surviving, I think. Uh, the system. Um, I don't know. I don't have one significant accomplishment. Um, there are times when you make uh, the right guess and there are times when you have uh, some influence on policy, and sometimes that can be a negative one, and you made the wrong guess. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, I will say this, that I got into the Middle East, um, not immediately. After Vietnam and Laos, I came back and sort of took a pay cut and started all over at the State Department, which by then had added a couple grades at the bottom, so I came in lower than I would have two years before. Uh, but. Uh, my first assignment was in Washington on African affairs, and that uh, was research intelligence. And uh, they gave me a choice of three posts in West Africa, and I chose Conakry, Guinea, which was just opening up and where the, I thought my French would be useful. So I went into Conakry, Guinea with the first charge d'affaires to open up our first post there. And that's where I met my wife, Claude, who was a French nurse who had come down uh, to do some temporary duty there, and uh, we extended her temporary duty a little bit. Um, but um, after that, it took us a number of years, like five years, before we actually got married, uh, and we lived separately in the meanwhile. 
Uh, after that, I went, to, I went to Europe, to Munich, for a year. And at that point, I was a little bored with not having sort of more action. So I, I asked to be transferred after one year. Um, and uh, they gave me, a, when I went back to Washington, they gave me a three-way choice, I remember. One was as political officer in Rio de Janeiro, which would have been very pleasant. Another would have been Eastern European Affairs, uh, although it was on the personnel side until I got my assignment there. And the third was Israel. And I was quite interested in the Middle East. And I said, well, I'll go to Israel. And uh, after that, it seems that I always seem to come back to some part of the Middle East uh, assi in assignments. Uh, I had a number of Middle East assignments, including places like London, where I was, however, uh, my area was what we used to call from uh, Bangladesh to Marrakesh. Uh, I don't know how many countries, 40, 50 countries. Uh, and that's how the London embassy operates, as well as the Paris one and some of the others. Um, after that, uh, I traveled to, from London I went as uh, deputy to the ambassador and ended up uh, being deputy to four ambassadors during one year, one of whom was kidnapped and killed. The first one uh, had a cancer and I had to take over. Um, two others were special emissaries. So I was in charge of the embassy during the Civil War, 75, 76, for uh, about half of the year that I was there. Uh, my wife and children arrived, hardly unpacked, and they were um, sent off again. They went to Paris. After about a month, I think, they were there, or maybe possibly two in the summer. And we had that very dangerous civil war, um, which in many ways was even more dangerous than the next post I went to, which was supposed to be a rest post, Iran. Uh, they gave me the choice there between Iran and Canada, and I thought Iran might be a little more exciting than Canada. Um, I was sent there as chief of the political section and actually served as deputy to the deputy who became the charge in between ambassadors. And that, of course, meant we stayed there for about three years. Um, my family managed to get evacuated again when the uh, revolution came on. And uh, after that, I went back to Washington. I, and again, I was offered different jobs, but ended up as director of uh, the uh, Office of Regional Affairs and something called the National Security Council uh, Coordinator, whatever that meant. I guess this was basically to make me feel a little better because I wasn't a deputy assistant secretary, which was fill, filled up at that point, uh, was full. So basically, uh, that was kind of towards the end of my career. Now, if you had to give advice to today's SAI student, what would you tell them? Well, uh, what would I tell them? <laughs> Study well and be lucky. Uh, I, think, I think government service is, uh, can be very, uh, can be fun as well as useful. Um, I have been, I've noticed that the 50s and early 60s was when people wanted to work for the government. And then we got into the late 70s, 80s, even 90s, where working for international business, particularly after the end of the Cold War, became the thing to do. People were interested in making money. Uh, if you go into the Foreign Service, you better not be interested in making money. Uh, when you retire, you may be able to land a good job. You may not. Uh, but. The, the Foreign Service um, can be a lot of fun for two kinds of people. One kind of person, the kind I think I am, is interested more in the field, in mixing with people, in reporting on what's happening, and perhaps making recommendations on policy, but not the other kind of person who goes in because they want to run American policy, in which case the best way to do that is to stick to Washington as much as you can because that's where 
most policy ends up being made with lots of the politics being mixed in. And nowadays, more and more than in the old days. In the old days, uh, people in the State Department, for example, were supposed to concentrate on foreign affairs and let the White House and the politicians worry about foreign policy overall. But uh, the things have gotten mixed in together, and of course, um, the press and uh, nowadays media of various kinds, including the blogosphere, have gotten involved in things. You have instant news. Uh, so I teach courses on diplomacy as well as other international relations because that's where I ended up, uh, not immediately after retiring from the Foreign Service because I, uh, I, did, uh, I was looking for jobs teaching and came close on a couple. In fact, I, was, uh, I passed the exam process with the board of directors of a college in Greece. Um, only to find out, just as I was about to go, that the person leaving changed his mind and stayed on. Um, and then somebody in the Foreign Service, who was already at Brown University, passed on the news to the, to the State Department. And uh, through that connection, I became a fundraiser. I'd never done that before, but they wanted someone to set up fundraising internationally. They had something like 70 fund fundraisers domestically but nobody doing it internationally. And that way I ended up probably the first American setting up an international uh, fundraising effort. Uh, there were one or two who came very close who did specific places like Japan. But uh, nowadays it's become a big thing. Um, after I left Brown, after three and a half years there, I came to the IISS in London did the same thing for the ISS in London for a couple of years, then went on to various charities in England. I stayed on here and then gravitated into teaching, and that's what I've been doing for 16 years or so. Wonderful. Now, I, I do like to ask this question because, I mean, somewhere along the line, um, regrets, any regrets at all in the, sort of the, the, the career path that you've You've taken? Well, you know, I, on the whole, I was pretty lucky and, and happy and uh, regrets. Yeah, I could have targeted my assignments at times uh, in order to maybe move ahead faster. Um, I didn't target. I usually waited to see what the opportunities were and what, and I also, the idea of a pleasant assignment did not escape my notice as opposed to just something that might move my career faster. Um, it is true that in the Foreign Service, and I did serve in personnel for a couple of years um, as chief of the training section, where I put people into training. And some of the fastest movers didn't want to touch training because training just slowed them up on their way to the top. And uh, I would hear from time to time of people who were predicted to get to the top faster because that's what they really wanted to do and they would sacrifice anything for it. So it depends on the personality of people. Different people do different things. And you met your wonderful wife, Claude, so. And <laughs> yes, she's there Many years listening of happiness. to these things. <laughs> yes, indeed, we've been married since 1964 and we met five years before that, so that puts us close to 50 years. And have your children gone into uh, uh, things internationally? Uh, well, that's interesting. I've got, we've got two daughters. Yeah. The older one uh, went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps pushed by me, who knows. Um, met her husband afterwards, who was working, he's an economist, and that's how they met. But then changed their mind about what she really wanted to do and uh, went on and got another master's degree um, when she was in Washington in uh, psychological social work. And she has become a, a very able uh, uh, therapist for young children, for, for not young children, for children and others, but basically with an MA in, uh, in psychological social work. My younger one, played around with the ideas of this and that. She majored in English as opposed to politics, which was the older one. They both went to UCLA, which was 
someplace I could afford as opposed to most other schools uh, because we had uh, in-state tuition. And uh, they, uh, my younger one went on to Boston College and got a journalism degree and she's bounced around quite a lot. She ended up going back to California, marrying a, uh, a guy she had first met in college uh, many years later, like 10 years later, and they are now living in California. And she, uh, she has a young uh, daughter, my grandchild there, who's three years old. My older one has uh, adopted two uh, Cambodian children, and they are now nine and 10 years old. And, Everybody's great. So they the live. internationalism does come full circle, right, within your family uh, context. It's a wonderful Absolutely. story. My son-in-law with the older daughter uh, is of Lebanese background, even though he's never been there. He's born, he was born in South Africa. He moved to England very early, one or two years of age. Uh, he worked in America where he got his PhD at Stanford, and uh, my daughter met him in America, and now he's back in England. Uh, heading a, um, the Institute of Development Studies, which is one of the two major institutes of development studies in this country, and among the top in the world. And they live in Brighton, so we see them wonderful. fairly frequently. That's a wonderful story. The other lives in Los Angeles, which is a little less frequent. I'm, I've lost count now. How many is that? Just two. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have... We have a house. Includes the, son, the, 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 son in, the son's in law. <laughs> well, actually, my other son in law came from New Zealand. Uh -huh. So we really have an international uh, you crowd. You do indeed. You do indeed. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. And I forgot to mention at the very beginning that we're here in London um, uh, with George uh, Lembrakis and his wife, Claude. Uh, and so pleased to be here. So pleased that you're our speaker tonight. Um, with uh, SICE alumni in London and speaking on the Middle East, a very hot topic as, as we know, and we're going to have a packed house in a few minutes when we go downstairs. So I thank you, and this will conclude our uh, oral history interview for SICE, and I must let you know that I will be so pleased to talk to your classmate Sam Lewis, who has agreed uh, to share some of his memories uh, back in the day on Florida Avenue at SICE. So thank you so much. Thank you.